Over the last 900 days, I've used Create to completely transform this cave, but there's still so much more to do. So over the next 100 days, I'm gonna build an insanely over-the-top casing factory and attempt to use Create to mine enough netherite to make a full netherite beacon. But before I could do any of that, I wanted to make sure the new Create updates didn't break anything around the base, so I ran around to each build to make sure everything was still running. I took a bit longer to check out the storage area since it always seems to break or just get backed up, but thankfully, everything seemed to be working perfectly. The gold generator was just about to overflow, so I converted a bunch of gold ingots to gold blocks, dumped everything into the storage system, and continued checking the rest of the builds. Once I knew everything was working, I checked how much netherite I actually had, and realized I had a lot of work to do if I wanted to make a full netherite beacon before day 1000. My plan was to make a massive netherite mining machine, so I checked in the auto crafting room to see how many mechanical drills I had laying around. The chest had 218 drills in it, which was a good start, but wasn't nearly enough. I grabbed a bunch of iron and andesite and loaded up the auto mixing setup to make tons of andesite alloy. While the mixers were running, I checked my random chest to make sure I wasn't missing any drills somewhere, and then I went to the surface to collect all the drills that were on my old nether tunnel bore. I wanted to get everything done before the sun went down, so I went to town on the tunnel bore with my wrench and extendo grip, and I can confidently say that it was way easier to tear it down than it was to build it. After catching a quick nap, I cleaned out the remnants of the tunnel bore from my inventory and loaded up with deep slate to start terraforming a new area so I could build an automatic casing factory. I decided the area next to the experience generator would work well, which meant it was time to finally tear down the nether portal that I made like 900 days earlier. Because I had no idea what my casing factory would look like, I wanted a clean slate to build from, so I just started filling in the entire area with deep slate to try to level it off. I spent the next three days clearing all the random foliage from the area and filling it in with deep slate. Once all the terraforming was done, the area looked way smaller, but definitely looked easier to work in. Since I had no idea how I wanted my casing factory to look or function, I started by just trying to plan everything out. I decided I wanted the factory to be visually appealing and not just efficient, so I mapped out three different rows for the three different primary casings. My inventory was full of junk from the terraforming, so I cleaned everything out and collected some mechanical drills, deployers, random building blocks, and crafted a few pistons so I could start building the mechanical bones of the factory. My plan was to have a piston pushing placed blocks through each stage of the casing crafting process, so I put one down at the beginning of each row. Each piston will be moving logs to start the process, so I also put down a deployer to place logs in front of each piston on each row. I put down another deployer on each row directly next to the first one and planned for it to use an axe to strip each log. I realized I was going to need to monitor the state of the blocks in each row at specific points, so I spent ages crafting a bunch of smart observers. I put oak logs in as the filter for the first deployer and tossed my netherite axe in the second deployer just so I could eventually test the setup. I put down a smart observer in front of the first deployer and set it to read when an oak log was in front of it and then connected it to the piston using a redstone link. I gave the system a quick manual test to see that it worked and the piston did in fact move the log which was a good sign. I decided the manual test wasn't enough though so I made a basic water wheel setup to automate the deployers for testing but quickly noticed I had the netherite axe deployer in the wrong setting and it was actually breaking the logs not stripping them. I changed the setting and everything seemed to work, but I decided I didn't want the log stripped right away, so I tore down the second deployer and moved it over three blocks. I replicated the initial deployer and smart observer setup, but used stripped logs instead, and then did the same thing again after that with andesite casing. Finally, I put down a mechanical drill at the very end of the row to mine the andesite casing, and yet another smart observer to tell if the casing had been mined. To finish off the initial setup, I crafted a diamond axe and tossed it in the log stripping deployer, so I didn't have to use my netherite axe for testing. With the mechanical components of the setup pretty much ready to go, I spent the next two days working on the redstone logic to automate everything. I cleared out a bit of extra space behind the deployers and did tons of trial and error to make an extra large AND gate that would dictate when the piston pushed the entire row of blocks. Eventually, I settled on a gate setup using three inverted signals from the first three smart observers and one non-inverted signal from the final smart observer. I set all the redstone links to be receiving, and then set the frequencies for all four pairs of links. At the end of day 912, it was finally time to test the redstone, so I put down the specific filtered blocks in front of each smart observer and verified the corresponding torch turned off each time. When I put down the andesite casing, the piston pushed the log, which confirmed the gate worked since all the criteria was met. I was absolutely thrilled because the system was working perfectly, so I just kept tossing down logs until the piston finally stopped because the deployer holding the axe wasn't actually connected 
connected to rotational power yet. Unfortunately, my single water wheel setup wouldn't be enough to power everything, so I tried planning out how I wanted to expand the existing water wheel setup next to the casing factory. After fiddling around with various setups for majority of the day, I wasn't able to find anything that worked due to the limited space that I left myself between the existing water wheels and the pistons. I decided it would probably be better to just make a hidden water wheel setup to power the whole factory. I cleared out even more space behind the deployers and shifted the entire mess of redstone just a few blocks over to free up some more space for the water wheels. Even though I knew exactly how everything should work and what the frequency should be, it still took a pretty long time to get the AND gate back up and running. I figured I might as well go all out if I was going to be hiding them anyway, so I crafted a bunch of large water wheels, placed some of them down behind the experience tanks, and then connected them to a rotation speed controller. I ran rotational power from the rotation speed controller to all the deployers and then the drill, and then sat back to watch the system work flawlessly. After the system was done with that round of casing, I started mapping out where I wanted the walls to go around the casing factory. I grabbed a few chests from the storage room and also started mapping out the opposite side of the room that I planned to use for inputting items into all the different deployers. I wanted to work on the redstone for the input chests, but because I only had 40 redstone left in my entire base, I began prepping to go on a small tunnel bore mining expedition. It had been so long since I last ran the tunnel bore that I completely forgot where I normally set it up, so I had to dig a new tunnel all the way down to bedrock. I put down some tracks with a cart assembler and placed down the minecart contraption, but of course I forgot to power the assembler first, so I had to clear out the area around the tunnel bore before reassembling it just to try to avoid random deep slate getting stuck to it. Almost immediately after getting it running, the tunnel bore ran into an issue where it wasn't mining the cobbled deep slate it was placing down in front of it to remove any liquids. I was super confused since this never happened before and tried resetting the tunnel bore multiple times before just completely giving up. So I returned to the surface and took the elevator back down to the base. After getting a good night's sleep both in game and in real life, I went back to the surface on day 921 determined to troubleshoot the tunnel bore. I placed down some tracks with the cart assembler, remembered to power the assembler this time, and tossed down the minecart contraption. I double checked all the chests to make sure there wasn't anything funky going on and then fueled it up and let it run for a bit. After about 20 blocks, it hadn't run into any problems, so I picked it up and while I was initially happy, my mood turned pretty quickly. I ended up having to tear down all the cobbled deep slate the tunnel bore had placed and still had zero answers as to what was actually going on. Since it seemed like the tunnel bore had no issue when there wasn't anything in front of it, I took it down into the mine, but I planned to try it on stone this time instead of deep slate. I had to clear out a small area in an already existing tunnel so I could set everything up. Initially, I wanted to change the filter on the deployers to place cobblestone so I could just be 100% positive that everything was perfect, but after tearing all the drills off, I remembered the filter is now on the side of the deployer, so I gave up and almost immediately put all the drills back on. I fueled the contraption up and it took about 10 seconds before it experienced a catastrophic failure. Because I'm a man of science, I figured I'd give it another shot and yet again, the contraption failed. I wasn't sure what was causing the problem. I knew it had to do with blocks being in the way, so that basically didn't do anything for me. I was still feeling too lazy to manually mine, but I also still needed redstone badly, so I went back down to bedrock and just removed all the deployers from the contraption. I made some adjustments to the chassis sticking range and placed the drills back on the front before powering the assembler and fueling the minecart. This time, everything worked flawlessly, but I wasn't able to AFK on the seat since there wasn't anything to stop lava from spilling all over the place in the tunnel and killing me. The next few days were pretty low key since I had to keep following the minecart contraption, which was super slow, but I used the time to mine all the exposed ore on the walls rather than waiting for the run back like I normally do. Once my inventory filled up, I was so done with mining, so I picked up the minecart and booked it back to the base to get back to the actual fun stuff. After I got home, I put the minecart on the minecart unloader and sat back enjoying not having to manually unload the chest like I used to. Eventually, I got bored, so I cleaned out the random contraption blocks from my inventory, grabbed as much valuable stuff from the unloading chest as I could, and dumped all the silk-touched ore into the ore processing setup. I grabbed the remaining valuables from the unloader and put everything into the sorting system. With my redstone stockpile semi-replenished, I started the next day off by crafting a bunch of smart shoots to use for the factory input chests. I put smart shoots under each chest and put a threshold switch behind each deployer and put a redstone link on each one of those. I almost immediately realized I needed the backs of the deployers open for inputting items, so I spent a while just staring at the deployers trying to figure out how to attach 50 different things to the six available sides. I decided the only option was to tear up all the shafts and then relocated the threshold switches from the back to the side of each deployer. I reset each of the threshold switch settings and placed back down the redstone links. Once that was done, it was relatively easy to run the rotational power under the deployers and use gearboxes to input power 
power since the direction of rotation didn't matter. I remembered the mining speed of the drill seemed to be the system bottleneck during the last test, so I put down a rotation speed controller and used that to input into the mechanical drill. I wanted to try and get everything set up properly before doing another test, so I put down some extra, mostly useless input chests after miscalculating the amount of item types that I would need for the factory. I slapped down redstone links on each of the input chest smart shoots and started digging out the area under them for a belt line. I ran the belt line under the floor from all the input chests over to the deployers and realized I may be able to save a bunch of space using a mechanical arm to distribute the items from the belt. At this point, my brain was a bit fried from all the technical stuff, so I used a 932 to do some random things like crafting and placing placards on the input chests and then running around the base to collect all the assorted items that would go in them. I ended up trading with the blacksmith villager to get an unbreaking two diamond axe since I had way more emeralds than diamonds and figured eventually I'd need a lot of axes to keep the automated setup running. Surprisingly, my brain actually felt pretty refreshed after getting a 15 minute break from trying to build the Death Star out of create blocks and redstone, so I spent the next day crafting a bunch of vanilla and create redstone components that I thought I might use to make the complex input chest dropping setup. In hindsight, I probably should have cleaned out my inventory to make the crafting easier instead of walking around with multiple buckets of water on me and an extendo grip all the time, but oh well. With an inventory full of random redstone components, I used the next two days for setting up the framework for the input chest redstone. I put a threshold switch behind the oak log input chest and adjusted the settings so it would give a redstone signal when it contained a stack of items and not give a redstone signal if it didn't. I set the smart shoot to only drop stacks of 64 and put a redstone link on it. I set the redstone link to receiving since the entire purpose of the complex setup would be to power on the chute to drop a single stack of items. Randomly, I realized that the chest looked super lame, so I took a momentary break from redstone to switch over to barrels and redo all the placards. I returned to the redstone grind by setting the frequency of each threshold switch that said if the deployer still had items or not. The next five days nearly mentally broke me as I tried setting up the logic gate to make the input barrel only drop a stack of items when a deployer ran out and not allow another stack to drop until that specific deployer had been refilled. I experimented with some basic AND gate setups, but it was clear it wasn't going to do the trick, so I expanded the gate using a pulse repeater into an inverter. Eventually, I added in a pulse extender as well and did some experimenting to figure out how many ticks would allow exactly one stack to be dropped. As if there wasn't enough assorted redstone components, I added on even more by putting a powered latch at the start of the chain. I finished off the redstone monstrosity by connecting the powered latch back to the gate so that it would reset whenever the deployer received its items. I did some last minute fine tuning of the redstone and tested it repeatedly to make sure it actually worked as expected. Once I felt confident, I counted how much space the entire thing took up and cleared out just enough room to build a duplicate directly across from it. Thankfully, it was much easier to replicate the build a second time than it was to build it the first time since there was no experimenting left to do. Once the second one was fully set up, I cleared out even more space so I could build the rest. The next two days were pretty mundane since I was just building the same redstone setup on repeat three more times. As surprising as it may seem, I actually started missing the trial and error testing that I had to do earlier since it ended up being way more entertaining than this was. As day 944 was ending, I came across some deep slate coal ore, which I remembered was pretty rare, so I took a second to admire it before finishing the fifth and final redstone logic gate. I started day 946 by setting all the empty redstone link frequencies, and I'll admit it started to get a little confusing since the entire factory was going to be using over 20 unique frequencies. After I finished linking everything, I cleared out some extra space next to the mechanical drill and ran rotational power from the rotation speed controller to the mechanical arm. I used a large cogwheel to speed up the arm even more and then reset the arm inputs and outputs. The end of day 946 and entirety of day 947 were spent hooking up the belt that would carry items from the input barrels to the mechanical arm. I wanted the belt to be running as fast as possible so it wouldn't slow down the factory when deployers ran out of items, so a shameful amount of time was used on cogwheel trial and error. Eventually, I got fed up with cogwheels since the setup was getting super messy. In the end, I cranked up the speed of the two existing rotation speed controllers to make the entire factory faster, which made running the main belt at a high speed require way less cogwheels. I also remembered the direction of rotation for the drill didn't matter, so I flipped the controller's rotational direction and the main belt finally worked. Once that was done, it was super easy to power the additional belts under the input barrels. With everything hooked up, it was time for the official trial run of the andesite casing portion of the casing factory, so I spent the morning filling up my inventory with oak logs, some fresh diamond axes, and plenty of andesite alloy. I loaded up each input barrel, and the second I put a
a stack of oak logs in, the factory sucked them out, and everything started running. I sat back and watched the gorgeous, wickedly over-engineered factory running flawlessly right until it ran out of andesite alloy. I did a bunch of redstone troubleshooting to try to figure out why the andesite alloy wasn't being sent to the deployer, and after making tons of adjustments to the smart shoot and threshold switch settings, I realized I didn't have any links on majority of the input barrel threshold switches to even tell the system it had items to drop. I added in the links and set the filters, and the split second I set the andesite alloy filter, a stack dropped from the chute, and the factory was back up and running again. I watched the factory run for a bit longer, but remembered there wasn't anything collecting the casing yet, so I made a quick makeshift output collection point with a barrel and a hopper. I wanted to feel confident everything was truly working properly with all the minor adjustments I made before I went adding in the additional two rows for brass and copper casing, so I let the factory run through all the resources I deposited. The entire time it ran, I just kept thinking how thrilled I was with how it looked, which was great because automating casing itself is super easy if you don't care about looks. This was a whole nother beast. At the end of day 950, I checked the output barrel and had nine freshly made stacks of andesite casing, which was a pretty good start. The next day, it was finally time to add on the brass and copper casing rows to the factory, so I grabbed out a bunch of leftover mechanical components from my dump chest and went on a bit of a crafting spree to fill in the rest. Majority of my crafting was redstone components since I kept thinking stuff wouldn't be too complicated and undercrafted pretty much every time I made more. Once all the crafting was done, I jumped right into duplicating the andesite row two more times for copper and brass. Thankfully, it didn't require any planning or testing since everything already worked perfectly, but the factory had grown in complexity so much that it took me three days just to get everything hooked up properly, including getting all the frequencies and redstone settings correct. I ended up having to clear out more space behind the factory to make room for even more redstone, since I forgot the current setup only kept the piston moving blocks along for the andesite casing row. I replicated the exact redstone right behind the initial setup, but used the brass casing frequencies this time, and while the redstone wasn't really hard, I really struggled with the inventory management trying to get all the links working. I also put links on the brass and copper casing pistons, set the frequencies, and then dumped some oak logs into the input barrel to see if the initial portion of the brass row worked. Unfortunately, the andesite row started running, which was a little bit of a red flag, so I took out the remaining andesite alloy in hopes of eventually being able to check if the brass row worked at all. While I waited for the andesite alloy and the deployer to run out, I cleared out even more space and built the piston control for the copper casing row. It was finally time to start connecting rotational power to the brass and copper machines, but when I checked the stressometer, I noticed it would only have enough power to hook up one additional row. Since that was very clearly not an option, I grabbed some additional large water wheels and expanded the already large collection of them that I had hiding behind the XP factory. I went to check the stressometer to see if the four new water wheels added enough stress capacity, but I quickly realized I didn't even set them up properly and had to break an additional block below each one. Once I fixed that small issue, there was more than enough stress capacity to run the entire factory. I started off day 958 by connecting every single machine in the factory that didn't already have rotational power. If you can believe it, the process was actually relatively simple since direction of rotation didn't matter for literally any of these machines, and I had planned ahead leaving plenty of space for shafts and gearboxes to run between everything. The only thing left to do was to test out the two new rows, so I ran around the base grabbing copper ingots, oak logs, and brass ingots, and tossed them in the various input barrels. Right away, I knew there was a problem since all the copper ingots fell right onto the belt, so I did some troubleshooting and noticed I completely forgot to set some of the copper redstone frequencies. I fixed the frequency issue, reloaded the barrels, and had to manually jumpstart each row since the piston wouldn't activate if the row wasn't filled with the proper blocks. All three rows of the factory running at once looked absolutely awesome, but unfortunately the awesomeness didn't last forever since eventually the deployers ran out of logs, and that's where the next big problem started. Because the deployers at the start of each row needed oak logs, and they all came from one input barrel, the redstone would easily malfunction if two deployers needed logs around the same time. The problem itself was really easy to figure out, but the solution was a little bit harder, and I quite literally sat staring at the redstone for the oak log dropping for 10 minutes trying to think of what to do. By the end of day 960, I had tried out a bunch of different potential solutions, but right as I was about to rip my hair out, one finally worked, where a convoluted set of links reset the powered latch each time any of the deployers received logs, so the log request itself didn't jam up. At this point, my brain was absolutely dead, so I cleared out my inventory and loaded up on various building blocks so I could try to make the factory look a bit nicer and hide the massive amount of redstone that made it all work. I started off by outlining the casing portion of the factory in tiled deep slate and then used slabs 
attempts to blend the walkway from the XP factory and casing factory together. I continued using a similar design from the XP factory and outlined the ground in spruce slabs before finishing outlining the input barrel area with tiled deep slate as well. I replaced a bunch of the cobbled deep slate on the ground with moss and continued using the moss carpet and torch trick just to help light up the area. I made good use of the extendo grip once it was finally time to work on the ceiling since it made replacing the stone with cobbled deep slate and moss way easier. I added in slabs just like I did with the floor to gradually blend the different levels of the ceiling together and use tons of glow berries to decorate while also helping provide a little bit more light. I finished the area off for the time being by adding in copycat panels using the block of experience texture along with tossing some blocks of experience in the ceiling with the patches of moss. The next overkill step to make the factory look even cooler was adding in a display board over the input barrels. I built a 5 by 3 display board over the barrels but then I randomly got bothered by how I had the barrels unevenly spaced so I spent the entire rest of the day breaking and replacing the barrels and all the redstone components. Day 968 was pretty uneventful since I spent quite literally the entire day trying to decide on what block I wanted to fill out the wall behind the display board. I couldn't think of a block other than deep slate that wouldn't look out of place so I messed around with adding in some stairs around the barrels for at least a little bit of additional depth. The wall behind the display board didn't look totally horrible anymore but the display board itself wasn't even functioning yet so I set up two small water wheels in the ceiling above it and put display links on each of the input barrel threshold switches. I had to fiddle with the display link settings to get the board to look nice and finish it off by using a clipboard to name the display. The next three days were spent building the output chest portion of the factory. I outlined the last remaining wall of the factory with tiled deep slate and spruce slabs and built a 4x3 display board to also show the contents of the output chests. I mainly did it because I had no idea what else to put on the upper portion of the wall and it would look weird if there was nothing there. I filled in the wall behind the board identical to the input area but instead of using barrels I used chests since three double chests would perfectly fill up the length of the wall. I powered the display board just like I did the other one with some hidden water wheels in the ceiling above it and ran a belt behind the chest with brass funnels inputting into each one. I spent a shameful amount of time trying to get the rotational power to the belt since it always seemed to be going in the wrong direction and set the filters on each of the brass funnels. While I tried to funnel all the casing from each row onto the belt using hoppers and shoots. I used a 974 to hook up all the display links for the output chests which wasn't hard but required me to put down smart observers that the chest didn't actually need. I also had to adjust the wording on the board itself since some of the lines were too long and actually got cut off. Once I was happy with how it looked I used the clipboard again to name the display and was finally able to remove the makeshift output barrel I had been using for way too long. Since the entire factory was pretty much done at this point I cleaned out all the random junk from my inventory loaded up on tons of different blocks needed to make each type of casing and dumped it all into the input barrels. It was finally time to craft a stupid amount of drills so I loaded up on iron ingots and andesite alloy and started converting as much andesite casing into mechanical drills as possible. After the first round of crafting I realized I was gonna need way more andesite alloy so I reloaded the automated mixers and waited until I could basically refill my entire inventory. Even after that crafting session I still had casing to spare so I did one more round of mixing and crafting and by the end of day 978 I had 12 stacks of mechanical drills ready to go. Once I was done with my work at the casing factory I cleaned up the dump chest that had been sitting there for ages and filled my inventory with everything I would need to make a tunnel bore. My initial plan was to make a vertical nether destroyer since it just looked super cool but since I only had 20 days left I had to shift my plans a little bit if I wanted a chance to make a netherite beacon. I had to convert some logs to charcoal to eventually fuel the bore and then caught a quick nap before going to the surface. Obviously right when I got to the surface there was a group of pillagers there because why wouldn't there be? So I had to dispose of them but their captain wasn't even there so I didn't get the debuff. I didn't have anywhere that was really flat to build the massive bore so I actually just started building on the ice and put down my old tunnel bore to modify. I tore off the entire front and rebuilt it with a 5x4 of deployers so I would at least have a small tunnel to protect me during the mining but had to break and replace the deployers again in a specific order to easily set the netherrack filter. After way too much struggling with setting them up I turned the deployers on the outside of the 5x4 backwards so the netherrack would be placed behind the drills and not get mined. I put down chests on the back of the linear chassis to hold what the bore mined but also had to remove the existing chests which were filled with super random blocks. I noticed the new chests would be right where the deployers placed the tunnel blocks so I expanded the deployers to be a 6x5 and made the new outer deployers place backwards. The last thing left to do was place down the massive drills on the front of the bore which took me the next three days to do. I finished off the bore by putting brass funnels on the chests and setting them to drop everything except 
except ancient debris to try and keep the chest from overflowing. I glued all the drills together, made some torches I'd probably never put down behind the tunnel bore, and headed into the nether to see what I could do with the last 15 days. I took the path down to my previous tunnel bore location and set up my new super overkill nether destroyer 9000 that would clearly work with no issues. Out the gate, the bore was working well, but quickly ran into the same issue the other bore did, where it wasn't breaking every block in front of it and eventually would prevent it from placing down rails. For some weird reason, I hoped it would eventually rectify itself, but after manually breaking a bunch of netherrack, I just picked up the bore and went back to the start of the tunnel to make some adjustments. I really only cared about the two blocks right in the middle of the tunnel being properly cleared so the bore and myself could pass through, so I put down two additional drills behind the deployers to make sure every block was actually broken. I reassembled the tunnel bore, and after struggling for a while with blocks not even properly gluing together, I got it all in one piece and started it up where it last left off. The bore ran for the next 10 days, and I slowly traveled behind it, placing down torches whenever I would remember, and avoiding the massive lava flows that would fill the tunnel until the bore was way past the pool of lava. On day 998, it was finally time to call it quits in the nether since I needed time to convert all the ancient debris to netherite and build the beacon. I picked up the tunnel bore and spent almost the entire day running nearly 2,000 blocks back to the portal. Once I was back in the overworld, I placed down the tunnel bore and started pulling out all the ancient debris I could carry. But there was too much, so I made a trip down to the base and used the bulk smelter to convert it all to netherite scrap. I went back to the surface to grab the rest after making some room in my inventory and dumped all the tunnel bore materials into the cart contraption chest while I waited for more debris to smelt down. After all the debris was done smelting, I started converting the scraps over to ingots and quickly realized I definitely wouldn't have enough for a level 4 beacon. I converted all the ingots into netherite blocks and ended up with 36 blocks and one ingot left over. I tore down the top of the gold beacon and replaced the first two levels with netherite blocks before standing back to admire it. It may not have been a full beacon, but it still looked pretty sick. And with that, it was day 1000. I managed to make a wickedly over-the-top casing factory and collect enough netherite to make a level 2 netherite beacon. Be sure to let me know in the comments what part of the last 1000 days was your favorite.